UFC 299 O'Malley versus Vera 2 takes place this weekend and I'm going to go through the entire card starting with the early prelims ending with the main event giving my prediction and breakdown for every single fight on the card and what an amazing card this is stacked top to bottom let's start straight away with the early prelim opener of Joanne Calderwood versus Marina Moroz. Mayer spoke too soon saying stacked top to bottom but we got to get through a couple fights first Joanne Calderwood Marina Moroz. This is actually a tricky one to predict because it all really comes down to what version of Joanne Calderwood is going to show up. Marina Moroz is pretty good herself, but I, I don't think she's at the level of a Joanne Calderwood. And I know that sounds crazy to say because Joanne Calderwood, it's not like she's some world beater in her own right. However, um, she did beat Luana Carolina and she beat her very clearly as well. And there seems to be a skill level difference in women's MMA where you go from non-stop, either way, 29-28 decisions to actually having the skill level to create a clear decision win. You know how rare, especially in the lower weight classes of women's MMA, you don't know how rare being able to clearly win a decision actually is. Like, it's very difficult to do. And she's been able to clearly win decisions. Her losses in hindsight haven't aged that badly. Alexa Grasso put her down and submitted her. Uh, she lost to Tyler Santos as well by submission in the first round. But other than that, she's beat some good opponents. She's lost to some decent opponents. Um, I, I rate that way more highly than Marina Moroz's Ah, uh, she beat Maria Agapova because, in hindsight, Agapova had like one round of danger anyway in their fight. So, you know, I'm gonna side with. Who am I gonna side with? Because it's actually kind of tricky because people forget Marina Moroz won a decision against Mayra Bueno Silva. So it's a very tricky fight to predict. Trickier than people would expect. When first looking at this matchup, I hate to take this long on the early prelim opener, but I have been thinking about this. I don't mind losing to Jennifer Meyer because she is great on the ground and has great jujitsu and great grappling. And she's very short and stocky and strong. I I'm actually going to take Marina Rod Rodriguez to implement takedowns here. And I think that just being able to get takedowns in women's MMA is really going to drastically affect scoring if it is close. So I'm actually going to side with Marina Moroz in this opening fight over Joanne Calderwood. I think Calderwood has an advantage on the feet. But I'm going to say that Marina Moroz has enough of an advantage in trying to get this fight to the ground. And I think she will be able to get this fight to the ground. Um, and she's way younger in her prime. Joanne Calderwood's 38. So you know what? I'm going to go Marina Moroz because of her grappling. We move on. Up the card. CJ Vergara versus Asu Almabayev. I'm obviously going to go with Asu Almabayev. Not just because of the grappling. You know, it's easy to just sort of just say, oh, Asu Almabayev is going to be able to get a takedown. It's because CJ Vergara has just... He's just yet to impress me. You know what I mean? He's yet to impress me in his career. He's had moments where I'm like, okay, this guy's a tough guy. You know, he survived a dangerous first round against uh, Daniel De Silva. But in my honest opinion, you shouldn't have to survive a dangerous first round against Daniel De Silva. Get him out of there. He's garbage. You know what I mean? Treat him like it. Venetia Salvador, I truly believe this, is garbage. Arguably could have won that fight against CJ Vergara. Oh, well. You know, CJ Vergara gets a very close decision win. I just haven't been impressed by CJ Vergara yet in his career. And uh, I think he's going to be in some real trouble here against Al Mabayev, who, although we weren't convinced on when he started his career, because sometimes you see these guys from a place that you don't recognize and you wonder, okay, well, what is the regional talent like over there? And then you find out, you know, oh, well, it's like an Azat Maxim who ends up looking terrible against Charles Johnson. Um, but I'm looking at the fact that Tatsuro Teira easily dispatched of CJ Vergara in their fight. Ode Osborne beat him unanimous decision, a common opponent where Asu Almabeyev dominated Ode Osborne in that fight with his grappling. I am going to have to side with the grappling of Asu Almabeyev. Um, I was worried for a long time about him making his debut, though. I'm going to be honest. Because Almabeyev, if I'm remembering him as the right guy that I was looking into, um, his, yeah, his regional career... Is less iffy than others, to be fair. A lot less iffy than others. He fought at Brave. I like the regional career. I'm going to go with Asu Almabayev 
winning this fight by submission in the first round. We move on. Up the card, Rebellis Despain versus Josh Parisian. Now, this might be the easiest fight to predict on the entire card. Josh Parisian about to beat that ass. I'm joking. No, he's not. He's obviously not. You want to know why he's not? Because I don't go to the gym. I don't go running. I don't work out. And I'm in better shape than Josh Parisian. I literally just, recently especially, stuff my face and do nothing. And I'm in better condition than Josh Parisian. Maybe not cardio-wise for a fight, I understand. But I think there just comes a point where you've got to admit, man, Josh Parisian, you don't have genetics capable of making you look impressive in any way physically. And that is just what it comes down to with a lot of these heavyweights. They're training every day. They're at ATT. They're at these gyms. They're at these super teams. And they're at Scorpion Fighting System, as Josh Parisian is. One of his team names. It's just like, you aren't cut out for this, little bro. And Rebellious Despine is the entire opposite. I don't know how to pronounce his surname. So I'm going to have fun with it as time goes on. He's the opposite, man. He's 265. Did he weigh in at 265? I'm going to check his topology instead. Just to check just how big this dude is. Because it says it on Google. But that just might be the weight class. He does. So he's probably cut into heavyweight. Six foot seven. 87 inch reach. Josh Parisian is going to get absolutely butchered. Like a wild pig out there. I think honestly if they put a microphone dangling in the center of the cage. Even with a full crowd you could probably hear him, hear him squealing in there. I think Rob Ellis de Spain is going to mess up Josh Parisian so badly. And, it, and I think it just really does speak to how absolute garbage the UFC heavyweight division is. And how much, deep down, if I, if I wasn't making money on YouTube, how much deep down I'd want to try and make a run to the UFC heavyweight division because I would literally just retire after getting ranked. Because I'd be like, right, this is where my career ends. I've only done four years of training. I will not bother with the top 10, top five of the division. I'll call it quits here after a big win against Martin Bidet. You know what I mean? Like it's, there's just certain heavyweights to make you make, make you want to make a run. And this guy got subbed in round one by Martin Bidet. Beaten by Jamal Pogues. Like, yeah, I've got, I've just got to go with Rebellis Despain. Despain. I'm going to go with him to win this fight. TKO, Olympic medalist in Taekwondo. You know, you're speaking my language here. You know, I come up on Taekwondo. Um, I don't think he's a great martial art but for combat sports. And maybe at some point, he's going to have himself in a position off balance where a good grappler at heavyweight is going to be able to get into the ground. But it's just not going to be random fat guy 2003, Josh Parisian. You know what I mean? Because he's just one of those NPC characters. Will be the side quest in Rebellis de Spanier's story and will be forgotten about. I'm sorry. You should train in any way, if you want to be a UFC heavyweight. There's no way he's training with a body like that. Simple as that. Thank you. We move on. Mikel Pejia versus Mikhail Alexejchuk. I'm going to go with Mikhail Alexejchuk. I'm going to go with Mikhail Alexejchuk here. And I was saying that earlier this week because I'm starting to feel it. I'm starting to feel it because I was watching back a lot of Mikel Pejia fights. And I'm like, what if he doesn't finish Alexejchuk early? What if he doesn't get that dream scenario fight, which was the Andre Petrosky fight? He goes out there, faints a couple times, kabam. Finishes Andre Petrosky, who goes down. But, you know, Petrosky just got done arguably being fraud-checked by Gerald Mearshart or subsequently going on to be arguably fraud-checked by uh, Gerald Mearshart um, and really gassed out in the later rounds and showed that his striking was very rudimentary. Um, but Mikel Payer. Great performance against Andre Petrosky. He's going to be more built for the middleweight division this time round. I just don't think it's going to help him because I'm starting to think like, dude, you took Andre Fialho to a decision. You couldn't take out Andre Fialho, who is arguably known as one of the chinier fighters in the UFC. And maybe this is just the difference between welterweight and middleweight. Maybe middleweight Pereira is going to carry way more power. Uh, maybe middleweight Pereira is going to have a better gas tank because of a less of a weight cut. Maybe the skill level of middleweights is just that much worse than welterweights, which I believe that it is. But you're not taking out Pons Nibio. Now, I consider these fighters chinnable. Pons Nibio is chinnable. Andre Fialho is chinny. Like, he's a chinny fighter. He does not have the chin for the sport. 
and they're all decisions. And then it's the Nico Price fight, where Nico Price is chinny. I would say he was chinny. And Pay is not putting him away. And Price is making a rallying moment in round three, trying to beat up Mikel Pahea and take him out. I really like the chances of Alexei Chuk. If he doesn't get too wild early and just sort of like, okay, let me see what this guy's got. What sort of goofy stuff is he going to throw? Because I feel like if this was on a fight night Apex main event, or not main event, but feature fight, some fight night here or some Apex card here with no crowd, I'd actually like Mikel Pahea's chances more. <clears throat> But UFC 299, one of the biggest cards in recent history. There's going to be a crowd. I think is going to get lost in the source. And I think we're going to see Alex Achuk march him the fuck down in round two and beat him up and finish him. So I'm going to say round two, body shot TKO from Macau Alex Achuk because there's something you can't deny about Alex Achuk. Tough as anything. He is beyond tough. Watch back his fight with Chidi Nujikwani and it is literally the personified difference between heart and grit and no heart, no grit. That He was actually a bit of a punching bag at one moment, got wobbled by Chidi Nujikwani, got hurt and he just gritted down in the second Chidi faced any type of adversity and uh, Mikhail Alexejcik went after him and started doing well. He broke because Mikhail Alexejcik has got different power. So I'm going to say Alexejcik Round two, TKO on Mikel Pahea if he stays patient early. If he goes out there guns blazing, he could just get caught and out techniqued and out skilled. But if he gives Pahea some time to like feel himself a bit in round one and then starts to slowly put the pressure on, I think we'll see Mikel Alexejcik get a TKO win. We move on. And let's not forget as well in Mikel Alexejcik's career, if you go back far enough, there is a no contest due to a failed PED test due to a tainted supplement, I think it was, against uh, Khalil Roundtree. I'm going to go back and find it. Where the guy was shooting some pretty fucking good takedowns, to be honest with you. So there is also that option for him. We move on. Up the card. Jan Kutalaba versus Felipe Linz. I'm going to go with Jan Kutalaba over Felipe Linz is what I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with Kutalaba over Linz. Um... I think Kutalaba is just a lot more. I know he's dumb. And this is my worry with Kutalaba. But he's dumb and 30 years old and a physical freak. And there are glimpses of amazingness from Kutalaba. And that's what has annoyed me so far through his career. There are genuine glimpses in Kutalaba's career. By the way, the first fighter ever to shout out my channel. Shout out to Kutalaba. First fighter ever, because I broke down the stoppage in the first Ankalaev fight. And um, showing how Kutalaba was actually kind of tricking him. Uh, I wish I still... I might have it on this channel. Check back on this channel. It's one of my more popular videos of Kutalaba entering the Matrix. One of my, It was my first viral video because Kutalaba put it on his Instagram. Um, and it's him, like, catching kicks while pretending to be rocked and literally stopping Ankalaev's head kick right there with his hand. He has these moments where you're like, this guy's going to be a GOAT. This guy is going to be, not a GOAT, but this guy is going to be a force in this division. Like, he hurts Glover, nearly finishes Glover. You know what I mean? Like, and then Glover comes back and gets him. Like, a couple punches different. This guy's got a whole different career, but he is dumb. I just don't think Felipe Linz is athletically impressive enough to make him, to punish Kutalaba for being dumb. Because Jacoby, not really a KO guy. He can KO like a, no chin as a chukwu, but he's not really a KO guy, not really an explosive, wow, watch out, any punch could finish you. He's more of a tit-for-tat, pick-at-you type fighter, and you see when you allow Kutalaba into a fight like that, he went to a draw against Jacoby, and I don't mind the decision there, because he brought it in the third round, so I just don't think the uh, that Felipe Linz has the physicality or the athleticism to punish Kutalaba when he needs to. So I think it's just going to be too much of Kutalaba getting his own way, and I think that's going to lead to an early finish for Ian Kutalaba. Um, God, he has some good moments. He has some terrible moments, but I, I don't think Felipe Linz has the ability like a... Uh, I mean, you look back in Kutalaba's career, there's a trick with big, strong, powerful dude. You know, if he, he catches you, it's problems. Strong dude, hard to hold down. Uh, Johnny Walker, big, strong, powerful, athletic dude. Ryan Spann, big, strong, powerful, athletic dude. These are the, lose, the losses of Kutalaba's career. I just don't think Felipe Linz has that that suddenness to his game. So I'm going to go with uh, Kutalaba getting his own way and getting a finish here early. We move on. Up the card. Pedro Munoz versus Kyla Phillips. 
I'm going to go with Pedro Munoz over Kyla Phillips. Um, I'm not a Kyla Phillips believer. I'm not a Kyla Phillips denier. He has a good reach advantage here over Pedro Munoz. He's got a good game. Um, I rewatched his Song Yudong fight, which may have changed my prediction in the Song Yudong versus P.E. Yan fight, because I've been watching a lot of Song Yudong fights recently to try and see if I can pick him. Um, but Kyla Phillips, I just don't think he's going to be able to play the range game with Munoz with the low kicks. O'Malley couldn't, and no one wants to admit that. I thought O'Malley was edging the fight against Munoz. O'Malley really couldn't do anything to Munoz. And I think O'Malley is way better at playing that range game and the creative striking game than Kyla Phillips is. I think he's way better at it. I think he's got better conditioning to do it. And you just have to admit, listen, Munoz stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Marlon Vera for three rounds. Didn't get dropped, didn't get wobbled. This guy don't get dropped or wobbled. It don't happen. Look at any point throughout his career. He does not get hurt. And I think Phillips' style is almost like the reason why he does it is that there's a payoff that his opponent will be hurt at some point. You know what I mean? He throws the head kick and then he switches, spinning back fist, moves in, jump, flying knee, then a head kick to finish. Like, his style is like the output that he gives is for the payoff that this guy's going to get dropped at some point. This guy's going to get hurt. I might be able to get a TKO. And against Munoz, I don't see Phillips mixing in takedowns like he did against Song Yudong. I don't see him dropping or hurting Pedro Munoz. And that means you're going to be locked in there with Munoz for three rounds. The bigger cage does help Kyler Phillips. But I think Munoz's low kicks might start to add up on him. And I'm going to go with Munoz um, getting this one done in the second and third round. I know the Howley and Piver performance is something that everyone can look at. But everyone has that one stinker performance. And to be fair, he did look like he was basically about to finish Piver in that first round. And he really went for it. And it was kind of the to the detriment of him. Um, but I like Munoz standing toe for toe to toe with Marlon Vera and making it a competitive fight. He lost. But he made it a competitive fight. And again... I speak to the O'Malley fight. Dude, O'Malley couldn't do shit against Munoz. Strike numbers have Munoz ahead. O'Malley, I thought, was winning because he was checking the kicks of Munoz. But that's it. That's it. Maybe O'Malley's so tall and rangy that Munoz was difficult for him. But Phillips ain't far from that body type of O'Malley. Maybe it'll be enough to where he'll be a bit more on Munoz's level and it'll be easier. He won't have to duck down to throw shots and come down to Munoz's level as much, which will play into Munoz's game. But O'Malley couldn't do anything. He couldn't get his kicks off. He couldn't get punches off. He landed a couple punches in the fight overall, checked some low kicks, landed some low kicks. But beyond that, like he couldn't actually get anything. And I think that Munoz is going to be a tricky one for Phillips because... If you plant in the center with Munoz, he's actually good at planting in the center. But what people deny about Munoz is when you move around a bunch, he can do that as well. Watch the Frankie Edgar fight where Edgar's skirting around the octagon. Munoz is moving well himself, switching his stances here and there. Big fast twitch movements. Shimmy shimmy in his way into range before he cracks a low kick as they circle out. I think Munoz will get this one done by decision, 29-28. Uh, I can even see a draw where he beats up Phillips in round three, but loses the first two. So take that for what you want. I think Munoz will get him as the fight goes on. We move on. Up the card. Mateus Gamrot versus Rafael Dos Anjos. I'm going to go with Mateus Gamrot over Rafael Dos Anjos. Um, there's a few fights in Rafael Dos Anjos' career where you're like, wow, he's amazing. But then in hindsight, you're like, hmm, how good is he really? You know what I mean? Some of his wins haven't aged too good and his losses haven't aged too good. Tony Ferguson beating him up for five. This is ages ago though. I'm going to skip way forward because there's no point even looking that far back. But I'll go as far back as the uh, Covington fight, you know? Did a good, had a good performance in that fight, to be fair to him. Um, and I think Covington is very Gamroy, I think we can say. I think gamrot has got better technical wrestling than, than Covington. I think Gamrot's a bit stronger than Covington. I think his striking's a bit more versatile than Covington, especially this current version of Covington and even the version of Covington that fought RDA. I thought the best Covington was the one that showed up against Usman twice, but maybe that was just to speak to how bad Usman was waiting to be beaten by a guy like Leon Edwards, who I picked twice because of that. Um, either way, it's difficult, man, because he had a good performance against Leon Edwards, but everyone looks good against Leon Edwards if they're not Covington. Like, they look good, and Edwards edges them out every time. Even Nate Diaz wobbles in, but Edwards wins the decision. Like, it's hard to put too much stock into what he does. It's a three-rounder, which I think definitely benefits Gamrot because he can go at a higher pace. 
I don't see RDA getting no guillotines because Gamrot don't shoot open for guillotines. I don't think RDA has punishing power on the feet for Gamrot to worry about. And I think his body type is very easily manipulated by Mateus Gamrot. I think it is. I think it's very easy manipulated by Gamrot. He's 39 years old. He's been talking about retirement and then coming back. And then, oh, no, I am retiring. Now I'm coming back. I think Gamrot's going to be able to just hoist him up by a single leg, tip him over, drag him down, body lock against a cage. The thing that worries me about RDA here, at lightweight especially in his recent career, man finished Felder five days notice. I know Felder's good and I know Felder has good wins, but Felder was like, Felder took him down in that fight. And I really thought, like, Felder did not train grappling in the build-up. He was literally training for a marathon. And that made it a smaller Felder for the fight. He looked really lean, really skinny, really gaunt in the face, cutting the weight. I thought he looked terrible in that fight. He still went five hard rounds with RDA. Still went five hard rounds. Stuffed a bunch of takedowns. Barely got held down. Got his own takedowns on RDA. I'm going with Gamrot. And I think one thing I like about Gamrot in this fight as well, you couldn't ask for a better dream as an ATT lightweight. You couldn't ask for a more dream scenario as an ATT lightweight than to have Dustin Poirier in training camp for the same card as you. You couldn't ask for a better, for a better situation for him. So I actually think we're going to see the best Gamrot. He's got his main training partner in Poirier, who's a scrappy 5'9", not the same way RDA is scrappy, but, you know, he doesn't want to be taken down. He wants to keep it standing, land his shots on the feet in volume. I think this is great for Gamrot. And I just don't think RDA has the stopping power on the feet. Um, and I think he'll actually get ragdolled a bit here, to be honest with you. I think he'll get ragdolled and it'll be a sad, sad retirement. Um, plus, Gamrot's still getting better and he ain't taking much damage. It's not like when we see Gamrot go to war, it's like a technical war. It's not like, wow, they really beat the hell out of each other. No. Goes to a technical war where you're just enjoying the technique on display. Um, I, I think that he'll be able to beat RDA here. More improvement. More comfortability in the spotlight. I'm going to go with Gamrot. We move on. Caitlin Chukagian versus Macy Barber. Oh, God. I, I'll go Macy Barber. I, I just don't think Caitlin Chukagian's good. Um, I know she has a different surname now. Oh, no. Back to Chukagian. That marriage didn't last long. Um, oh, no, no, no. There you go. Oh, no, no, no. Wait. Oh, no. Hang on. Wait up, uh, wait up. Uh. All right, I don't know what's going on with her name, but either way, she's trash. So I'm definitely going to go with Macy Barber. You just look at the recency of Caitlin Chukagian's career. It doesn't speak to me as someone who's really committed to their fighting game right now. She didn't fight in 2023. It's already March of 2024. And her last fight was October of 2022. She's been out for like a year and a half. I never like that, especially for a 35-year-old woman. Um, lost to Fiorot. Put up a decent fight, but Fiorot can be made to look quite bad if you can put out good volume on the feet because she doesn't have much stopping power. I think that might be the difference in this fight, though. I, I think it might be the stopping power and the strength up against the cage and on the grappling exchanges of Macy Barber. She punches like a man. She grapples well. 25 years old as well. That needs to be mentioned. 25 years of age. Um, I think Macy Barber's been looking good since she moved up to flyweight. I didn't like her performance against Andrea Lee. I thought that was an awful one, but most of these girls have an awful performance here and there. I liked her win against Amanda Ribas. <clears throat> and that showed off her stopping power. As I show off my fucking power. You know what I'm saying? I just let out a nasty fart there. Um, I'm going to go with Macy Barber. Too much finishing potential, man. I think she'll have visible damage advantage. I think she'll have the respect on the feet over Caitlin Chukagian. And I think she'll be stronger than her when she needs to be. So I'm going to go Macy Barber. We move on. Up the card. Curtis Blades versus Jailton Almeida. You know what? I'm going to say it. I'm just going to say it how it is. Only Tom Aspinall beats this Almeida guy. Only Tom Aspinall beats him. Now, maybe Blades can. Only Tom Aspinall or Cyril Garn at a push with Cyril Garn as well is going to beat this Jailton Almeida lab experiment freak roid abuser. There's no one going to take him out of heavyweight. Obviously, John Jones, but I'm saying that's going to be around. You know what I mean? Because Jones is dipping soon. Um, conveniently. Either way, 
I'm going to go with Jelton Almeida over Curtis Blades because he's 20 and 2. He started as a boxer and he's taken these. I think he just realized he was a light heavyweight. He was like, okay, I can make light heavy. I can beat Anton Cercali. I can beat this middleweight sized uh, Dagestani guy on uh, the contender series and ragdoll him and I've got a size advantage. Hang on, the real money's at heavyweight and they're all fat men. And Blades is a fat guy. He's a fat fuck. Um, he's a big fat fuck. But he's a fat fuck, nevertheless. And I, I, I think his stand-up is good. I think his counter-hooks are good. If you watch back his Pavlovich fight, dude, I'm telling you, after what we know now about Aspinal Pavlovich, where Pavlovich's chin isn't entirely granite, dude, Pavlovich is lucky not to get dropped or wobbled in that fight by Blades. So maybe it speaks to the less power of Blades, but uh, maybe the less speed that Aspinal has. But, um, I mean, Blades was tagging him coming in. So there is a shot that Blades could, if Almeida, for whatever reason, wants to... Get comfy on the feet first. There's a chance Blades could just sort of find his counter shots on him. But, um, man, Blades' grappling has been overrated for years. And although I used it to justify Rosenstruik uh, being able to beat Gaziev, my rosenstruik Gaziev prediction was mainly based on the fact that Gaziev is a morbidly obese fat man who just so happens to be a big dude. Um, which is 80% of heavyweights, including Curtis Blades. Dorcas is trash. You got smoked by Pavlovich, landed a couple good ones. You used your Gamrot powers to take out the knee of Tom Aspinall. That don't count. Um, although he was looking quite fast and turned on before that, or switched on, should I say. Fuck, I messed up there. Um, <sighs> Derek Lewis was stuffing takedowns against him. Like Blades could not get a takedown on Derek Lewis. Look how easy Almeida toppled over Lewis, man. Like, I just think there's a difference in athleticism. And Blades is a fat old man, so. I'm going to go jail to Almeida. Sad as it is, because he is a blatant roid abuser. Blatant, blatant roid abuser. Um, I think it's going to take an Aspinall's athleticism or even a Cyril Garn to beat him. Because I think Garn beats Blades. I, I think Garn beats Blades. I think he stuffs Blades to takedowns. Um, I know a lot of people just wrote off Garn's takedown defense from the Jones fight and said, ah, oh, Spivak beats him. I was like, dude, Garn has good takedown defense. He just threw the fight against Jones so the UFC could have Jones succeed against someone that Garn, and Garn who went to a split decision with to try and diminish in Garnu's stock. Like, it's all a big power play. Garn took the dive and he lives a bougie life because of it despite only having a few fights at the top of the sport. Um, respect, you know what I mean? Do what you want for the money. Throw the fight against Jones. I'm going to take Jailton Almeida, getting onto the hips of Blades, and just being better than him, even while being way lighter than him. I think he's just going to be way better at grappling, and I think he will win a decision again. I don't think he finishes. I think he'll win a decision. We move on to the main card. Peter Yan versus Song Yudong. I've switched. I was on Song Yudong. Uh, why? Dude. Why does he have that name? Good thing I said Song before it. Jesus. I was picking Song Yudong for a long time. Now, you know from history, if I switch a pick from a hunch, I'm usually wrong. So I'm actually cursing Peter Yan here. But I realized something the other day when I was doing research for this card. I was looking through Song's career and I was breaking stuff down. And I was like... Oh my god, I haven't watched the Chris Gutierrez fight. Because I was in South Africa. And I saw the results. And I saw no result from Song Yudong Gutierrez. Because I guess it was a boring fight now. I and mean, it wasn't a great performance from Gutierrez. He looked shit towards the end. Laying on the ground and stuff like that. Um, so I actually never ended up watching it. Because I just saw the headline of, oh wow, Khalil Roundtree slept Anthony Smith. That's it. That was a, that was a great card. Did Tatsuro Teiro win? That's what I was checking up on on that card. Um, and I was like, oh shit, I haven't watched Song Yudong Chris Gutierrez. So I watched it back. And I didn't I didn't see a guy that can beat Peter Yan, unfortunately. Um, I know it was a five-rounder, so maybe he was pacing himself. And I have been using that in my opinion on Song Yudong beating Yan. And thinking, you know, it's a three-rounder. He's different in three, in three-rounders. But Yan can be a bit more go-getter in three-rounders as well. I don't like the Jimmy Rivera performance from Yan. I think he got schooled by Jimmy Rivera and luckily got two knockdowns. But if you look into it, he actually got stung by a box jellyfish swimming in the ocean for training camp in that fight. Literally like a couple of weeks out from the fight. 
He got badly stung by box jellyfish in the water, nearly died. So that might be a reason for how he looked a little bit worse. Um, but I'm just thinking to myself, if I'm picking Song Yudong and going through my mindset, I have to justify it by saying that he will KO Yan. I can't say, oh, this guy just shuts down and bullies Yan for three rounds. I don't think that's going to happen. So the reason why I would pick Yudong is if I would say, this guy KOs Yan. And then I look back and think, all right, well, let's say since 2022 in his recent career, Marlon Marais is someone you KO'd. Welcome to a club that includes my nan. You know what I mean? Anyone can. Couldn't finish Corey Sandhagen, didn't drop him, stumbled him a few times, but I think O'Malley's, uh, not O'Malley, Sandhagen's center of gravity is made to be tumbled. You know what I mean? Jan's very tucked up, very compact. He's going to be less wobbleable or off balanceable than a song, uh, a Corey Sandhagen who's taller, lankier. If he gets cracked, he may go a bit skew if over to the left or the right for a bit and, uh, and then get back to work. So I, he couldn't drop Sandhagen or hurt him. Couldn't really drop Gutierrez or finish Gutierrez with nasty strikes. Five rounder that was. Stinky performance. Stinky, stinky performance. Um, Simone took him till the end of the, I think it was the late third and then the fifth where he dropped him. Ricky Simone, I thought is almost a bit of a chinny bantamweight. And if you look at Ricky Simone's career beyond that Song Yudong fight, Mario Batista beat the piss out of him. So it's like, where is this Song Yudong dude really set at? And is he just a really good style matchup to beat a Sandhagen who can't punish him with anything power wise? I'm going to say Yan is not going to be leaning back away from shots like a Gutierrez where, or a Ricky Simone where a guy like Song Yudong can catch him on the chin and put him away. Yan will meet shots with his head, with his guard. He will tuck over like he did against Aldo and catch and throw. There's a whole compilation of his catch and shoot uh, uh, moves on uh, YouTube. If you type in Piotr Yan, catch and throw or catch and shoot, he'll, he'll roll with the shot, punch off the same hand as you hit his guard with. He's very good at that. So I think that's where he can beat Yudong. That's where he beats Song Yudong. Uh, I think Song Yudong's going to be throwing the heavy shots. Yan's going to be catching him, cracking him back on an offbeat. And it's going to almost interrupt Song's combo that he might go for. So Song might throw a left hook, and then Yan will go tuck with it, bang, straight right. As Song Yudong's bringing his left hand back and maybe charging up a right, he'll get stung and go, ah, oh, fuck, I messed it up. So I'm, I'm going to go Peter Yam. I just, I'm worried about the, the three losses in a row. Peter Yan's mindset. He's still 31, but you know, you go from undefeated Terminator, which actually benefited Yan in his career because it was like this vibe and aura that he had and his opponents could feel it. You could see it on him. Like, when is this guy going to slow down? When is this guy going to feel anything that I throw at him? And after you watch what Marab did to him, it's like, is that aura going to be gone? Is there going to be more confidence from opponents going into fights against him? But in hindsight, the Marab fight... He kept up ish on the numbers and he barely got dominated on the ground. He got taken down a bunch, but he got right back up. Made Marab EPO monster to lastfully shoot 49 takedowns in a space of 25 minutes, which if you don't know, is a takedown failed per 30 seconds. Natural, this guy Marab. Um, I'm going to go with Jan. I'm going to go with Jan. I'm going to go with Jan. I, I'm annoyed that he couldn't put away Sterling on the feet, but you don't ain't shooting takedowns. You know, ain't picking at range like O'Malley with long shots and kicks and knees up the middle that he has to worry about. This is going to be a boxing match. More I think about it, a boxing match between Song Yudong and Peter Yan. I'm going to go Peter Yan. We move on. Up the card. Kevin, oh, Gilbert Burns versus Jack Della Maddalena. I'm going to go Jack Della Maddalena. I'm going to go with Jack Della Maddalena. You want to know Why? The Basil Hafez fight impresses me. So does the Kevin Holland fight. Now, a lot of people look through JDM's career and go, well, you know, he looked great, but then that Hafez and Holland fight kind of kind of crumpled his potential. Like, everyone looks at that uh, Hafez fight and Holland fight and goes, well, that's where his hype is over. Now he's overrated. Now he's trash. He you were hyping this guy up. Look how he looked against Holland. Look how he looked against Hafez. I'll be honest with you. He blatantly, clearly beat Hafez two rounds to one without fucking question. Everyone was calling that a robbery because they hate to see a ginger brother win. That's how it is. I get it. 
blatantly beat Hafez two rounds to one. Could have finished him in the third with some ju adjustments as well. Um, I also want to make a point about Hafez. And fights in general that step in on short notice. Give me a second now. Blatantly beat Holland, arguably three rounds to none. You know how difficult that is? He stayed calm and composed and never got cracked or wobbled or hurt against Kevin Holland in 15 minutes of fighting him. Kevin Holland at welterweight, rangy, dangerous, much larger reach than uh, Jack de la Madalena, never got hurt by him once. Randy Brown's looked real good. He's looking like a welterweight Jalen Turner since he's lost to JDM. JDM puts him on skates, never got hurt, never got wobbled, never got dropped. His striking defense is Yan-esque. But I want to make a point about Basil Hafez. Do I think Sean Brady, if they fight again against JDM, beats JDM? I actually do. I don't think Burns does, though. Um, but I'm going to talk about JDM. How, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you about this. How the flying fuck, USADA, do you know that Basil Hafez isn't a fucking roid abuser? It's a question I've had for years. But I'm going to drop it on you in this video. How the fuck do you start to know that Basil Hafez is not a roid abuser? He's not on your system. You've never tested him. Never. No six-month window. No nothing. The Contender Series is a very good addition to the UFC because it means they can get some tests done on these guys, like Quinlan, who ended up popping and ended up not being able to make his debut for about a year. They can do some tests on these guys before they even get into the UFC. JDM's on a main card, about to get his uh, chance at the rankings. This guy wanders in from the regional scene on a day or so's notice after training for another fight. So he had a training camp. Wanders in. Oh, what's up, guys? One you saw the test? Sure, why not? Just one. How do you... You don't have a repertoire on that guy. So I think it was impressive that JDM took him on and beat him. And after the first round where he immediately got taken down and started pulling dumbass guillotines, if JDM pulls a guillotine in this Burns fight, he deserves to fucking lose. And the UFC should never go back to Australia. He won't pull a guillotine, though. No. He's been training with Craig Jones. I imagine since the Sean Brady camp started and since the ba Basil Hafez fight happened, he has been training with Craig Jones a whole lot. I saw him in training camp with Volk, who was training with Craig Jones in the embedded episodes of Volkanovski versus Tapuria. He's training with him. I think that's going to improve his submission defense. It's going to improve his grappling intellect. I think he's going to be able to sting Burns on the feet. Burns is good. Burns is powerful-ish. Um, he's strong-ish. Not quite. There's no real thing in Burns' game that he's the best at in the division. JDM's going to put that jab on him. And once he puts that jab on him now, He's going to start following up with that right hand. And he's going to start landing body shots on Gilbert Burns. And I think we're going to see here in this fight, hear me out. We're going to see vulnerable, pathetic Gilbert Burns. Because when, I love Gilbert Burns. He follows me on Twitter. It's all good. You know, Burns is a fan of the channel. Much respect. But I think we're going to see vulnerable Gilbert Burns. We're going to see vulnerable Gilbert Burns. I don't look much into the Blau fight because it was a bit of a shit show for both of them. And Burns got injured. But he's just been injured. Hasn't fought since May, May of last year, recovering from that injury. And one thing I also want to mention about Burns, gallivanting around the world. I swear to God, whenever the UFC wasn't in the US, they'd pan to Burns in the crowd. And thank you for coming out to UFC Fight Night Iceland. Gilbert Burns in the building. You know what I mean? They just show Gilbert Burns in the crowd and he'd get his cheers from the crowd, you know. You know, and here we are in UFC Apex Falkland Isles edition. And then, oh, Gilbert Burns in the stands. Would you believe it? Came all the way down here. I was just like, what? what is going on here? Burns is everywhere. UFC Fight Night Madagascar. Burns in the front row. What's up, guys? Give me my cheers. I know he was injured. I like JDM's focus on the game a lot more recently. Burns is dangerous for him, but I think he's going to beat Burns. I think he's going to stuff the takedowns. And I think he's going to tune him up on the feet with a jab. And I think he's going to make him look like the Burns who got finished by Dan Hooker and walked down and beaten up and TKO'd. I think that's enough of a difference for uh, JDM to win this fight. Um, also, Burns bails on uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu attempts. He doesn't drive through them and get the takedown. He rolls out of them because he's got jiu-jitsu instincts to where if someone puts a guillotine on him, it's actually threatening. Most guillotines aren't threatening in MMA, so people drive through them, pick the guy up, clear the legs off to the opposing side, and they're safe. 
Burns bails and rolls on guillotines. So even if JDM does go for it, which he shouldn't ever once at all in this fight, Burns might roll it, and then that'll still give JDM an opportunity to separate, even if the guillotine isn't the correct thing to do. I'm going to go JDM, TKO's Burns, up against a cage, late round one. We move on. Up the card, Kevin Holland versus Michael Venom Page. I'm going with Michael Venom Page, and I think it's going to be the most boring fight on the entire card and maybe the most boring fight of the year so far. But MVP's going to drop Holland. He's going to drop him. He's going to drop him in this fight. I think people are looking at the competition level of MVP and going, this guy's trash. You know, he lost to, uh, God, what was the wrestler? I want to say it was Logan Storley, but I know it wasn't Logan Storley. But it might have been Logan Storley. You know what I'm saying? It might have been Logan Storley, where he arguably could have won, but he got outgrappled. Was it Logan Storley? It was Logan Storley. Um, and he also has lost to Douglas Lima. He has lost to Mike Perry in BKFC. But compared to like Rockhold and these other guys that have gone over to BKFC, MVP is the only dude tough enough to take it to Mike, Mike Perry. And even though, you know, BLM, I support Mike Perry and like put him first here and stuff like that. And I'm always biased towards him. MVP beat Mike Perry in BKFC. That's what I'm going to say. And I know it don't really come into factor here. But I think it speaks to the toughness of this dude. Bro beat Mike Perry. And they went to a sudden death round that was not needed. Okay? It was clear MVP. <laughs> it was clear MVP. They went to a sudden death round. Mike Perry won the sudden death round. He's Mike Perry. He wins. They didn't need a sudden death. I thought MVP was up around over uh, Mike Perry when they went to sudden death. So I don't think they needed it, but they did it. Business, business. You know, Mike Perry is the top of the BKFC guy. Um, I still think MVP's a beast. And I think Holland, I'm sorry, doesn't understand what low kicks are. He doesn't deal with them. He doesn't defend them. He doesn't check them. He doesn't move out of the way of them. His footwork is atrocious for a guy of his build. And I think once it gets off to a bad start where he realizes he's slower, he's worse, he's less powerful, and he might get finished, the old Holland comes out of him and starts acting like he doesn't care. Yeah. See, guys, I didn't even try. That's why I lost. I think that's what we're going to see from Kevin Holland. I think it's all going to come because of those low kicks. That's what I think it's going to come down to. Those low kicks, I think MVP is going to be moving well, moving well. You know what I'm going to guess happens? Holland is not going to respect the feints of MVP. Almost smartly, because you don't want to get caught up just reacting to everything and then MVP can make his reads. But I think he's going to get dropped in the first after a slow round of him getting his leg chewed up where he is not respecting the feints of uh, MVP. He's just being like, Standing his ground, covering up his guard a bit, not moving or anything like that, or trying to dart out the way. And I think that's going to lead to MVP finding his angle and not concussing Holland and dropping him bad to where he's like, oh my God, this could be a finish. But just sitting him down off balance with a straight right, right to the forehead as Holland's tucked up on one leg. You know what I mean? Just reacting to the blitz of MVP. And I think once he gets dropped, we'll see a bunch of him doing a bunch of Chris Curtis stuff like, come on, man, like talking this, putting his gum shield back in biting down and stuff like that. And I think MVP is going to do what he needs to do to get the win and to get to the Wonderboy fight, which is where he thinks he can really show off because Wonderboy is finishable and Holland is not, it seems. Um, and I think MVP is going to chew up his leg at range. Watch back the Pons Nibio fight. All I'm going to say is this. <clears throat> Tim Means had an all right first round against Kevin Holland. Alex Oliveira had an all right first round against Kevin Holland. Um, where is the fight against Santiago Ponzinibbio that I'm looking for? There it is. The fight with Santiago... First of all, Kies is a bitch. He sheltered up and, and lost. It's going to happen. I guessed it to happen that way. Against Santiago Ponzinibbio, who's short, chinny, ended up chinning uh, Ponzinibbio in round three. He was getting his leg fucking destroyed in that fight. Getting his leg destroyed in that fight. No answer to it. MVP is going to eat that up for breakfast. MVP, boring, shit decision, but he gets a highlight by dropping Holland in round one off balance. We move on. 
Up the card, Dustin Poirier versus Benoit Saint-Denis. I'm going to go with Benoit Saint-Denis. I'm a believer in Benoit Saint-Denis. Now, I've had moments where I didn't believe the entire way through because how could we tell you lost to Elezia Zaleski Dos Santos in your debut and your regional career wasn't that impressive? Sorry, please don't put me in another one of your Instagram montages of people that you proved wrong. I picked against you once, little bro. Maybe twice, actually. Maybe twice. I actually think I picked against him twice. Either way. Black belt in Judah. Great takedowns. Great chin, great scrappiness, great power. Poirier is coming off a head kick KO loss. Let me tell you why that's important. What is the most dangerous move of Benoit St. Denis's game that isn't a hook and like a power overhand or an L? Well, let me take it back. What is a move that Benoit St. Denis uses a lot when he's not in the pocket with someone? What's his go-to move when he's not in the pocket with someone? It's a hard body kick. That's what it is. It's a hard body kick. He destroyed, and I mean destroyed. This is one of the reasons why he made it look so easy against him. Destroyed Ishmael bon, uh, Bonfirm's arms. Destroyed them. You know, he beat Nicholas Stolze, beat uh, Gabriel Miranda, whatever. You know, he didn't really hit his stride yet. I'm not even going to look at those fights. Destroyed Ishmael Bonfirm's forearm. Took him down, choked him out in round one. Took him down, choked him out. After destroying his forearm with body kicks. Tiago Moises, there were body kicks again. And then when he got in close, he started tearing up Moises in the pocket. Getting caught on the chin, which is maybe where Poirier could capitalize. But I think it would be a Gaethje that would do it instead. Style-wise, I think it would be a Gaethje that does it instead. I think Poirier isn't the same off the back. Like, covering up and then swinging into something. He caught Chandler like it. But I think Gaethje is a lot more suited to catch Benoit Saint-Denis in that manner. And I think Gaethje's got better takedown defense than Poirier as well. So, I think that's where Gaethje would be a bit better against Benoit than Poirier is. Poirier, square hips, wide-ass torso. I think the body kick's going to be open. The liver is going to be open for Benoit Saint-Denis. Here's what I want to tell you. Poirier's coming off a head kick KO. Hasn't been KO'd many times in his career. He's coming off a head kick KO. That right hand of Poirier. Fuck, what stance is Poirier? I completely forgot what stance he is. I can't even think sometimes in my fucking head. Um, Dustin Poirier. He switches. He switches stances here and there. But he's a southpaw. Sorry. He, he can go southpaw. And he actually went southpaw against McGregor. Um, but he can do it all. But he likes a southpaw stance, you know? Um, fuck, what was I even going to say? I think Poirier is going to be on defense for his... Um, I can't think of what I'm saying. Oh, the head kick. He got head kicked. His arms are going to be glued to the side of his head because uh, Benoit Saint-Denis is coming off a head kick KO. And that's when you're going to see Benoit Saint-Denis landing that body kick Bang. Heavy body kicks. Chandler did it to Poirier. Over and over again. And what did Poirier do? He never tried to catch it. He never tried to block it. The whole time he was trying to keep from getting head kicked. Keep from getting head kicked against Chandler. Kept his guard up. Tucked into it. And just eight body kicks against Chandler over and over again. But Chandler's dumb. And this is another thing I want to talk about, man. The Chandler fight. People do not remember that the way it should be remembered. Poirier fraud checked him dude he finished him he out grappled him Poirier was getting the shit beaten out of him in round one until the last 30 seconds of the round where he caught Chandler and nearly put him away well done he then got dominated for the entirety of round two on the ground dominated on the grappling for the entirety of round two he got dominated round three Chandler about to resume domination but he's dumb, and Chandler's a dumb little moron. So he picks him up, does a big dunk. Whoa! Time to lose, everyone. I'm about to give up my neck. Gives up his neck to Poirier. Gets choked out. Chandler's dumb. In my honest opinion. Benoit Saint-Denis 
First of all, Poirier's hips are way too fucking square when he ends up against a cage. And he will be double-legged by Benoit. So people wondering if Poirier's going to catch Benoit as Benoit tries to beat him up against a cage. I think that's where Benoit's going to go. Right, that's a couple shots, an elbow, let's double-leg. Scoop him up, beat him up on the ground as well. I think Benoit beats the fuck out of Poirier in round one. Beats the fuck out of him in round two. And finishes him on the ground in round two as well. Um, with ground and pound TKO while Poirier's covering up. I think Poirier retires in the co-main event of a massive card. Um, I think Benoit Saint-Denis is going to beat him. I do. I really do. And Benoit Saint-Denis is a less powerful Chandler, slightly less powerful Chandler, with better shot selection. I think better finishing ability. I really do. He's less likely to fumble a rocked opponent, my honest opinion than Chandler is. Better shot selection than Chandler, with less power, better finishing ability, uh, better fight IQ, Better grappling logic and common sense. Um, and I think he's just way better than Chandler. And younger, better chin than Michael Chandler. I'm going to go with Benoit Saint-Denis. He's got the reach advantage over Poirier here by an inch. I'm going Benoit Saint-Denis, dude. He's fresh. Other than the Elezu fight, which he never should have taken on very short notice up a weight class against a guy who fraud-checked Renat for Kretinov. Um, I'm going to go with Benoit Saint-Denis. Getting it done by round two TKO. We move on to the main event, Sean O'Malley versus Marlon Vera 2. Now, I have been saying this for months about this fight. The second it was announced, I said this. Get ready for boredom. What do you think O'Malley cares about more at this point? Getting out the way of this rematch and winning it so he can get the Ilya Tapuria fight, which... I know people see as chasing greatness. Super fights are no longer chasing greatness. Super fights are a free title fight for a champion moving up. With no consequence. Move up, put all the risk on the guy in the weight division above you. If you lose, oh well, get right back to defending your belt and have another championship fight lined up. Super fights are a free title fight and a free build up, free promotion against a style where he can have fun. Against Vera... I think O'Malley is going to low kick him, school him on the manner of low kicks, and I think he's going to win this fight like Israel Adesanya did against Marvin Vittori, against Jared Cannonier, against Yoel Romero. Back up, low kick, sting out some shots here and there when Vera's open to be damaged, um, but I don't think he's going to try and KO Vera. I don't see the point in him trying to loop shots around the guard. O'Malley does it a lot with his thumb, Throws a lot of shots that land with the thumb around the guard. I think that's going to be something he has to 100% dial back. None of that, O'Malley. No trying to loop shots around the guard on Vera. They're right down the pipe or they're not at all, I think is what O'Malley needs to realize here. Um, dude, the first fight he was schooling Vera. I stand by that. And O'Malley couldn't stand by anything in that fight after his leg got kicked. But Vera literally landed two effective strikes. One was a partially blocked head kick and one was a big toe to the perennial nerve of O'Malley as O'Malley moved out of the way and made him miss a low kick. I know he didn't really miss, but he was trying to land with the shin on O'Malley's leg. O'Malley pulled out of the way, and as he did so, the big toe of Vera touched his perennial nerve. He couldn't move. Whilst having his leg shut down, he still couldn't be touched by Vera, landed better shots on Vera, and continued to pick him apart on the feet until falling over and then getting elbowed to oblivion. He did get KO'd by those elbows. That needs to be mentioned. But I think O'Malley's going to be able to pick at him at range. And I think we're going to see Marlon Vera stink up the performance in the main event. Not want to take much risk because when he does take risk, that's when he can be KO'd. I think O'Malley's going to steal the win. Point after point. Five extra significant strikes in round one. So Vera's 10. So O'Malley 15 to 10 over, o over Vera. 18 to 12 over Vera in round two. Uh, 20 to 17. Um, over Vera in round three. Like, these are going to be the numbers that we're seeing. Maybe Vera has a moment in round five where he says, uh, forget it, jump in front kick, this type, that, that type. Shoots a takedown, tries to attack O'Malley in the clinch like he did against Sandhagen. But I think O'Malley's got a better low kicks than Sandhagen. I think he's got more power in his hands than Sandhagen. And I'm going to say that he has more dangerous feints than Sandhagen. Sandhagen cannot feint with his hands. He's never going to KO you with a punch. O'Malley can. O'Malley can flick his head. I was talking to Demetrius Johnson about this because I can say that now. I was talking to Demetrius Johnson about this when we had an hour-long chat about this matchup. O'Malley's feints are believable because he can do what he's feinting at you. 
If O'Malley does that with his head, little twitch off to the side, you've got to actually watch out for a spinning back kick to the body or a wheel kick to the face. You know what I mean? He can throw a lot more feints. He can do the uppercut right hand feint because we've seen him KO someone like that. I think that's where O'Malley's going to win. Feinting, using the larger octagon, very important, massive octagon. In the apex when they first fought, tiny octagon. This is the massive open octagon. O'Malley's going to move way better and his low kicks are going to be more effective. I think he beats uh, Marlon Vera, who comes out of this fight looking a little bit like Chris Curtis against Jack Hermanson. Not to the same level of awfulness, because they're middleweights, they're awful. But I think it's going to be a more technical edition of that, where Vera is just getting frustrated and annoyed. O'Malley might land an eye poke, a groin shot, who knows. And uh, I think, I, you know, they want O'Malley to win. If it goes to a close decision in a war, they're going to rob Vera anyway. He has to finish O'Malley. And I don't think he can finish O'Malley, man, because I was watching back other fights of Marlon Vera. And he is good, and he's got good finishing potential, but man, Frankie Edgar was beating him. Catches him with a front kick in the third. Therefore, Vera wins the fight. Very good job from him there. Beat Davy Grant in the third round after beat, like, barely edging out the second. But he nearly lost that one. You know, he wouldn't have lost it. But you know what I'm saying? Like, he was, it wasn't going too well for him at a certain point. Um... Dominic Cruz was picking him apart. I know he was dropping Cruz. I don't like seeing Cruz land that much because Cruz doesn't have the footwork of O'Malley. Cannot low kick at range like O'Malley can. Cannot put you out with a punch like O'Malley can. And Cruz was fighting amateurish in that fight. Charging him with his chin open. Swinging one, two, three, four. He's fighting like Juliana Pena at times. So I am going to go with Marlon Vera. Rob Fon beating the pace out of him until Vera caught him and put him on skates. I think O'Malley's got an underrated chin. I think O'Malley is harder to land on than Rob Font and Dominic Cruz. And for that reason, I'm going to say that Vera doesn't get his knockdowns, doesn't get his TKO, and O'Malley chews up his leg before he can. Because when you're losing to Rob Font, you're taking punches to the face. Vera's used to it. They don't do nothing to him. When you're losing to Dominic Cruz, you're taking punches to the face. Vera's used to it. They don't do nothing to him. When you're losing to Frankie Edgar, you're being out grappled, but on the feet, you're being punched in the face. Vera's used to it. He knows what to do about it. When you are losing to O'Malley in a stand-up fight, you're getting your leg chewed to pieces and your body is screaming for oxygen because he's planting his front kick in the, ch in the stomach and he's spinning back kicking you in the stomach as well. I think we're going to see uh, uh, Marlon Vera get behind and he's going to be getting investment shots thrown at him. So he's going to be less effective when it's his time to go. I don't think O'Malley headhunts. And if he does, he's a dumb little idiot and a uh, cuck little boy. Little cut boy. Little loser. See you later. Goodbye. Toodle pip. I like O'Malley though. I think he wins. See you later. He's a cut guy. And he's disgusting for doing that with Neon when he had his kid on his lap. He's disgusting. But he's going to win.